Our message this morning is entitled, The Washing of Regeneration, from Titus chapter 3. As we return to the paragraph, the portion of Scripture that we've studied now for three weeks in a row in our series through Titus, we'll begin today by reading that passage of Scripture. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Today, our subject, our consideration, what we will study from this book, this letter that Paul wrote, Titus, is the foundation, or perhaps you might say the backbone, of the thoughts that we've shared with you over the past two weeks from Titus chapter 3. Now, just to remind you of what we've studied from this particular passage, first of all, we should obey magistrates. Christians are not to be rebels. We're not to be hysterical people screaming into the ether of the sky, angry at the world around us, but we are to be model citizens. We're to be people who obey the law as it is given to us by those who are in the world around us, those in the positions of authority, those who have the legal right to do so because the powers that be are ordained of God. Of course, the only exception to that being when the magistrates do one of two things, or the law, or the powers that be the legislature in our particular world, when they command us not to obey God, that is to say, if they say you're not allowed to have communion, you're not allowed to baptize, you're not allowed to evangelize, you're not allowed to meet in worship, you're not allowed to teach any tenet of the word of God, we ought to obey God rather than men. And at the same time, we don't obey when they tell us to do that which is sin. And we observed in that message two weeks ago from several passages, when God's people disobeyed, when they disobeyed the powers that be because the powers that be were commanding them to do something which is sinful. Secondly, from this passage, we considered that we should not be brawlers, we should not be fighters, we should not be all the time in controversy and in argument, either in a physical or in a war of words, but we should be gentle and we should be meek. We should be people who are not given to self-will, we should be people who are humble, we should be people who, because of the grace of God in our lives, respond to people with meekness and gentleness. And again, last week, it's a very difficult thing to do. It's a very easy thing to say. And as we said last week, as I step on your toes, I do so with bruised feet. Because if I preach on gentleness and it offends you, just understand before it bothered you, it bothered me Because I struggle with that in my life too. We all do, which is why the Word of God exhorts us to it over and over again. Think about that. The Word of God doesn't have to spend a lot of space exhorting us to do things that we naturally do. And when there's something that we're told over and over again, it's a pretty good indication that it's something that we struggle with. Obviously, being meek people, being gentle people, is something that so often we struggle with. But today, we come to the backbone of those principles. You remember that Paul says this not for the sake of establishing our own righteousness. Paul doesn't say to 
Don't speak evil of people. Obey magistrates. Be gentle and be meek so you can be a righteous person. He doesn't say to do this because it will transform your life in 10 easy steps. 40 days of transformation. Think of all of the gimmicky slogans that you sometimes see on church signs and banners. Told to do this and you will experience this in your life. Sometimes scripture says if you do this, this will happen. Certainly there are good positive motivations for serving God and the word of God. But Paul says for us to do all that we have read over the past two chapters, all the way back into chapter 2 with the aged men and the aged women, the young men and the young women behaving in a certain way, do all of this because God's grace has changed you. Paul would exhort the, I believe the Corinthians, not to receive the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in vain, And he would say that by the grace of God, I am what I am. Anything we are that is worth anything is through the grace of God. But God doesn't give us his grace just so we can hide this light under a bushel. He gives us grace that we would live in a certain way. To let our light so shine before men that others would see the good things that we do and glorify us. No. And glorify our Father which is in heaven. Good works, righteous living is because God has changed us and he has changed us for his glory. So many times when, and and I don't want to be critical, but I guess I have to be from time to time. So many times churches do good things for the sake of the photo op. If you follow churches on Instagram, you know that so many times If there's a food drive, if there's helping the poor, if there's something they did for someone, photos are snapped, posts are made on social media, hashtags are used, and it seems that so many times the righteous things that are done are more for the sake of a show to glorify the people that did it rather than the response to grace to glorify the God who gave it. We ought to do all that we do, not for our own glory, not for a social media campaign. There are things that we've done over the past year that I could have put on our Instagram page. We have an Instagram page. I didn't make it. I inherited it. A lot like eternal life. And I don't keep it up very well. If any of you want to, you can be an admin. I'll give you the password, and I'll log out maybe. There's a lot of things that this church did that you did over the past 12 months that could have ended up with a hashtag campaign on social media, and it would have made you look really good, but you didn't do it for that reason. You did it to glorify God and to help his people. Now, none of that is on the notes. None of that I intention, intended to say today, but Paul writes these exhortations built on the foundation of what God has done for us, and when we do these things, it is for the purpose of glorifying God and blessing his people. It takes me completely out of the equation. I'm not doing this for me. You're not doing this for you. We're doing this for the sake of the glory of God. If you've ever, if you've ever hold, uh, heard an older person pray, one of the things that people used to say a long time ago is they would end their prayer. And as a child, it always confused me. They would say, we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake and amen. And I always thought, we're praying for his sake? What does that mean? For the sake of his glory, for the sake of his name, for the sake of his cause, for the sake of his people. Sometimes you say things in front of little children and they don't understand then, but one day they understand. And verbiage such as that communicates a lot to a a young ear and to a young mind. We will today discuss primarily verses 3 through 7. And I do hope that we have time to get through it all, mainly because if we were to break it into two pieces, we would spend the entirety of our time today discussing total depravity. Now, there have been complete sermons preached here on the subject of total depravity, but total depravity by itself is a depressing subject. Human sinfulness, depravity, wickedness, the universal deadness that mankind is in trespasses and in sins without the grace of God in the world. What you were before Christ, 
What I was before Christ is a depressing subject. So I hope that we can breeze through that concept in the first half of our message and come to the sweet part of today's message, what we've been looking forward to talking about since we began this series, the fact that God has created us anew in Christ Jesus. And this was not by anything that we've done, for we were dead, but this was all according to his love, his kindness, and his grace. And again, all of the principles on how we should live throughout this book of Titus is based upon that. We speak the things which become sound doctrine, which beautify sound behaviors because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching them. First of all, verse 3, we want to give you a picture of human depravity. And Scripture does this in so many places. In so many ways, total depravity, what it looks like, what we look like without Christ in the world. This is one of the many pictures that Paul would give of it, and we'll reference maybe a couple of those in today's message. You have so many places where Paul talks about humankind without God and their inability, their unwillingness to serve him. As old school Baptists, which is what we are. This is the oldest Baptist church in the state of Alabama. Our articles of faith and our rules of decorum, our practice hasn't changed since 1808. And when we were founded, we were a, an average, regular, just general Baptist church in the United States of America. We were nothing special. It wasn't that the people that founded this church said, we want to hold to older principles that are forsaken today. They were just a normal Baptist church. But our church never changed through the ages. We still believe the articles of faith that are on the granite monument out front that was put there in the 1950s. We still hold to the truths of God's sovereignty and salvation as our Baptist forefathers did. We emphasize this today, and it's not emphasized often today. That has nothing to do with how good we are. But it is the truth that we hold to these principles We emphasize so often the fact that prior to the new birth, men and women, children and aged, if they be not yet born again, are not only unable but completely unwilling to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the gospel is folly to them. It is foolishness to them. It was foolishness to us before the grace that brought salvation has appeared to us, teaching us everything that we know and believe about our Lord, everything we read from from Scripture was complete folly before that moment in your life. We emphasize it in chapter 2 as we talked about our own personal B.C. and A.D., the time in our life before Christ compared to the time in our life after Christ. And there is a marked difference before and after Christ. Christ in our own individual lives. This principle that prior to the new birth, the message of the cross is folly, we have no desire to follow the Lord Jesus, this is something that is a well-established fact in Scripture. And I, I just want to name, read off a few of these passages for you for your hearing today, and I know that you know these passages, but we need to Hear and hear again these passages. There are times that I go back to when I have doubts. Is that really true? Is that really right? We're such a minority on this point. Are we right on this or are we off on some fringe idea? You know, the world is full of fringe ideas. I think fringe is norm. I think the fringe is the norm. Now, we're not all on the same fringes in this world, but it seems like the center of the road is such a hard place to be. We're a society of extremes, pendulum swings. I go back to these principles over and over to reground myself, solidify myself in what the Word of God teaches, what it affirms to be true. Human depravity and the unwillingness, the inability of man to serve the Lord Jesus, to even believe the message as it's preached, 
Let's look at a few principles, a few verses that espouse this principle, rather. John 5.40, Jesus says, Ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Ye will not come to me that ye might have life. John chapter 6, verse 44. No man can come to me. In John 5, he says, you will not. In John 6, he says, no man can. Well, that's terrifying, isn't it? If that's where the verse ended, that would be absolutely terrifying. I'd be looking for a way to explain that away. Wait a minute, I want to come to Jesus. I want to know him. I want to be a part of him. I want to serve him and follow him. What is it that makes the difference in your life that hadn't happened to the people to whom he said in John 5, ye will not come to me? No man can come to me, John 6, 44, except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. God the Father must draw us to Christ. Now, might I just interject, that word draw does not mean to woo or to win over. It means literally to drag. And as we'll see today, prior to the new birth, we were not merely sick. We were not merely deceived, though we were. We were not simply asleep needing to be awakened, but we were dead. And a dead man can do nothing but lay there and rot away. And that was us spiritually before Christ came into our lives. And so obviously, no man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And the drawing there has reference to being drawn from death in sin to life in Christ. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. We are drawn from death from being dead to life to being alive. You draw water from a well with a, a pail. You draw a fish from the water with a net. Now, in both of those instances, the water that is drawn is passive. The fish that is drawn is passive. We are drawn of God into his Son, and all of a sudden what we read in Scripture is viewed in a completely different light. What we hear in the gospel is heard in a different way. We now have been given faith and we can hear and rejoice in Christ by that faith that he gave us when he drew us to himself. You know, it's a very simple thing. Men are so often described as drowning and God throws you the rope. You've just got to grab the rope. I was listening to a, a soundbite a few years ago and it was a huge auditorium full of people. And the minister was preaching and he said, the problem is you're not drowning, you're dead. And if you've already drowned, you can't grab the rope. And as he said those words, the crowd erupted in applause and clapping and cheering. And I thought to as many times as I had made the same remark at a meeting, We've heard that so many times we yawn at the concept. I already know that. Because it is old to us. Understand there are people that when they hear that principle, it revolutionizes the way they think about the word of God, the gospel, God themselves. We are dead. If God threw us a rope, it would bounce off our cold, dead fingers. But God doesn't merely throw us a rope. God gives us life. And being given that life, we can now follow him and serve him. Understand, Adam did more than merely mess up humanity. There's a reason Satan is called a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. He slew the human race in sin. By one man, sin entered into the world after the deception of Satan to Eve. Adam takes of that tree, he does eat. Sin entered into the world, and what by sin? Death. Not only in a physical sense, but we are dead in a spiritual sense. Dead to the truth, dead to God, to the things of God, the teachings of God, the pursuit of God. We are corpses. 
I love verse 37 of John chapter 6, by the way. It's one of those verses I come back to. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Every single one. As we read in Hebrews 8, from the least to the greatest. And him that cometh to me, what? I will in no wise cast out. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. That's Jesus in John chapter 6. You say, what did Jesus teach? That's what the Lord Jesus taught. There was a group of unbelieving Jews in John chapter 8. Now here in front of Jesus, you have people that followed him, the disciples, people that heard and believed but were not yet disciples, and people that did not believe in the least. There's so many times in public, these three groups of people that Jesus interacts with. They begin to argue with him, and he asks in verse 43 of John 8, Why do you not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Now, were they deaf? No, they could hear what he said. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't hear it with a spiritual ear. How many times in Jesus' ministry did he say, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Ye are of your father the devil. The lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. What does he say in verse 47? He that is of God, of God, born of God, heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. What was their problem? They were of their father, the devil. That's why they didn't believe. That's why they didn't receive the words of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of times people stand before me, and I try to preach to them, and I do such a poor job, or maybe the Holy Spirit's just not blessing the service, and they may not be impacted by what I say, but understand this is Jesus preaching. If Jesus preached and people didn't believe on him, their hearts didn't burn towards him, they outright rejected it and rejected him, that spoke very ill of the condition of their soul. I fell in my sermons all the time, but this is Jesus we're talking about. The perfect preacher. The only preacher that never preached a bad sermon. The only preacher who never said anything wrong in the pulpit. There wasn't a pulpit, but you understand what I'm saying. He had the perfect application of every text every single time because he was the one that gave the word in the first place. The God-man, the perfect man. And when they rejected his words, that was a very condemning testimony of their state. John chapter 10 I told you, they they come to him, if you're really the Christ, tell us plainly. I told you, you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not. Why? Because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. You are his sheep today, beloved, but these people were not of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Paul describes the natural man, the unregenerate, all of us before grace in Romans 3 as those who don't understand God, verse 11, those who don't seek God, verse 11, and those who don't fear God, verse 18. They neither understand Seek, nor do they fear God. Which tells me if you read the book of Acts and you come across someone who's not yet been converted that fears God, that God's grace is already in them and they're waiting for the gospel to be preached to them to convert them. Think about Cornelius. That man wasn't an unregenerate when Peter got there. And yet he was in a gospel ignorance He knew a little bit through the Jews' religion, but he didn't know what the truth of Christ was. But he was a man that feared God, and God heard his prayers. And God sent the gospel to him. Think about the Ethiopian eunuch. Think about Lydia, the seller of purple, over and over and over again. We find that pattern in the book of Acts. There's a hungry, living child of God, a God-fearer, and God sends his word to them. 
My prayer this past week has been that God, like he did Philip the Evangelist, would send us to the Ethiopian eunuchs of our society, of our community. Dear God, send us to your children. We know that all that the Father has given you shall come to you. We just read that. And so, Lord, send us to them so that they can hear your word. Deliver them, please. No wonder, after reading all of that, and we did so very quickly, no wonder we find statements like we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. He would say in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. The man by nature, the man in Adam, the man merely born of Adam, not yet born of Christ, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. To discern spiritual things takes the Spirit of God. Before the Spirit of God enters into a man's heart, he is merely a natural man, having only natural discernment, he cannot discern spiritual things. He that is spiritual, verse 15, judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Why can you discern spiritually? Because you have the mind of Christ. Christ lives in you. You're no longer a natural man. Back to the book of Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> Why are men unable and unwilling to follow Christ before the new birth? Because they are Adam multiplied. That is to say, when they were brought into being at their conception, they were conceived in the same state that Adam was in after he sinned, a state of sin and death. And I hate to tell you, but humanity has only gone downhill since. You read Genesis chapter 3, you're like, that's pretty bad. Oh, but it got worse. They begin to have kids. These kids begin to kill themselves. Parents with multiple siblings, you can understand that part. It was even worse with Cain and Abel. He literally killed him. Cain killed Abel. The world began to tailspin down into idolatry, self-proclaimed wisdom that was really foolishness, and then you had sexual immorality, and then homosexuality, and then you had an, a world, a society filled with violence. I'm quoting Romans 1. And it wasn't very long after that that God judged the world and he destroyed it with a flood, which I believe is literal history. And I don't believe it was a local flood. The Bible says it covered the mountains. That'd be one big bubble of water, wouldn't it? If it only hit the Middle East. And every human being is the descendant of those three men, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, that were on the ark with Noah. We are Adam. We are Adam. Occasionally, Scripture uses that term to refer to mankind. We often think, well, if I were in the garden, I wouldn't have chosen what Adam chose. But the thing is, you were in Adam. You are Adam. I'm Adam. We are Adam multiplied. Let's begin looking at this passage itself to see the level of depravity, the way we were, uh, were and we'll hit them and move on quickly so we can get to the next part. For we ourselves first thing we want to notice from this is that Paul doesn't say you were. He doesn't say they were. It's easy to say they. A little harder to say you because you have to be talking to the person. How easy is it in our culture to say they over there are bad or wrong or this or that? So easy to be critical. But Paul doesn't say you. He doesn't say they. He says we 
we ourselves also were sometimes, which means at some point, back then, were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. This is one of the many descriptions that Paul gives us of life before Christ. He would do the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. You have been made alive when you were dead in sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That doesn't say disobedient children, but children of disobedience, and there's a difference. You might be a disobedient child, but you're not a child of disobedience. See how the structure of that sentence is important. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. Every one of us. Me, you, Paul, the Ephesians, Titus, the people in Crete that Titus would preach to every single one of us at one point had our conversation, our lifestyle in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature what? Neutral? Good with a little bit of bad? You know, this brings up the debate nature versus nurture. What were we by nature? We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. I'm telling you, life without Christ is a miserable, pitiful, disgusting, discouraging reality. How depraved were we, Paul? We ourselves were sometimes, first of all, foolish. If you read the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Proverbs, you notice a character repeated, repeatedly invoked over and over again. You have that which is wise, that which is righteous, and that which is just contrasted with or juxtaposed with the fool. There's a reason in the New Testament that Jesus says if you call a brother a fool, you stand at risk of hellfire in your life. In other words, judgment from God in your life if you call a brother in Christ a fool. Why is that? Because in Proverbs, in the Old Testament, so many times the word fool was used to describe the wicked. And so we don't call our brothers and sisters fools. We might say that was a foolish thing to do, which means that you're behaving as if you're a fool. It's what the fool would do. But we never want to call a child of God a fool. In the Proverbs, now remember, we ourselves were sometimes foolish. From Proverbs, we read the traits of a fool. He's the villain, in a sense, of Proverbs. He's angry. He's violent. He's wasteful. He's lazy, he's sexually immoral, and he's deceitful. That is the fool. In Psalm 14, 1, we even read, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, meaning that he's atheistic as well. We are not to call our brothers and sisters in Christ fools, because the word fool in Scripture carries weight of depravity, It goes back to last week's message and the way that we speak and the way that we use our tongues. But according to Paul here, we ourselves were sometimes what? Foolish. You read the villain of the Proverbs and all the foolish things that the fool does. That was the way we were before Christ. And we still have that nature warring against Christ in us today, which is why we must put it to death each and every day of our lives. We were also disobedient. Before Christ, though we can be disobedient and are disobedient many times in our lives, we lived in disobedience. In fact, we were the children of disobedience, disobedient to every single command of God. Sometimes people wonder, does God command all men or just his children to obey his moral principles from the word. Now, we know there are special commandments that are given to those that are born of the Spirit of God. But I'm talking about Ten Commandments type. 
commandments. For the unregenerate to be disobedient, it requires a commandment to be given for him to disobey. Does that make sense? The unregenerate lives in continual disobedience to the morality of God's word. And so because of that, he is disobedient. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, we understand that that means different things to different people. If you're born again, it means a different thing than if you're an unregenerate. But God commands the unregenerate to depart from his iniquity. The entire Old Testament is an example of that. Not all of those Israelites were born again when he gave them the Ten Commandments, and yet the Ten Commandments went to all of them. All of those laws went to all of Israel, and they had to do with all sorts of portions, compartments of human life, and they were to obey as a physical nation. We all were disobedient to the commandments of God. Deceived. He lives under a false premise, a false conclusion. Sin and Satan has beguiled the natural man. He thinks he's doing all right. Well, I've never murdered anybody, you might think. According to the law, if you hate someone without a cause or you're angry with a brother without a cause, you've committed murder in your heart. We're all guilty of all of the law. We have violated all of the law of God on one level or another. He's deceived living under the idea that either God doesn't exist or God's not too put out with him. Think about it. The natural man doesn't know that he's a natural man. The natural man doesn't know that he's a natural man. In fact, the concept of a spiritual man to him is a foolish thing. A spiritual man? Born of the Spirit? What nonsense is that? The natural man would say. Why? Because the gospel is foolishness unto him. It's folly. This is why in 1 Corinthians, Paul contrasts the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And he talks about the fact that the world thinks godliness is foolishness, but God says that his wisdom that's foolish to the world is the true wisdom, and the world's wisdom is foolishness unto him. After we've talked about what that word fool means, isn't it an interesting thought? The world thinks the same of you that God's word says of them. Folly. The natural man is deceived. He doesn't know he's a natural man. There's a line that stuck with me from a movie we watched a few years ago. How do I know what I don't know? How do I know what I don't know? Well, the natural man doesn't know what he doesn't know. He doesn't know that he's a natural man. Serving divers lusts and pleasures. Divers means different or diverse. But think about that. To serve lusts and pleasures means that we were, they are, slaves to them. Slaves to lusts and pleasures. You look out at the world today and you wonder, why is it the way that it is? And you think that it's somehow a strange thing. No, it's always been this way. Natural men serve different lusts and different pleasures, and they don't all serve the same one. We like to maybe ostracize a couple of those and point towards them as the really bad ones that they do but we don't do. But the fact is, without Christ, we serve different ones. With some, it might be power, it might be greed, it might be intimacy, it might be thrill-seeking, it might be self-destruction, it might be darkness because some people in the world worship darkness. You see people with skulls tattooed all over them and they're always dressed like they're the undertaker at a black plague funeral, there's a worshiping of death and darkness. It's a lust that people serve. To serve is to be a slave. Now, what are you a slave to, a servant to now? You've been bought from that master by your Savior Jesus by the price of his blood, and you are now the servant of Christ. You have been bought by him. You belong to him. And so we ought then to serve him each and every day of our lives. Living in malice. The word malice means badness 
and wickedness from the Oxford English Dictionary. And that definition is from 1605. It's what the word meant when it was translated into English. The Greek word that translates malice also meant wickedness or depravity. Malice means wickedness or depravity. What does he say of it? Living in malice. Living in wickedness. Living in depravity. To us, malice today means ill intent. But this is so much more than ill intent. It refers to outright depravity. We lived in depravity. Envy, discontent with the superior state of another, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Discontent with the superior state of others. In other words, what we would call today is jealousy. We would say, I can't stand that their car is nicer than mine. That just burns me up. can't stand that they make more money than me. I can't stand that their house is bigger and nicer than mine. I can't stand that you know, their children are this, or their wife is that, or their husband's this. It's jealousy. It's as cruel as the grave. It's envy. We lived in it. Boy, doesn't that explain the world? The world is in envy, discontent with the superior state of others. Hateful and hating one another. Before God came into your life, before grace changed you, you hated God, you hated His people, we hated Christ, we were creatures of hatred prior to God. We were haters of God. Now, that is a grim picture. Is it not? To know that you and I were disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another? You say, I came to church to feel good about myself. I hope you came to church to feel good about Jesus. That's why we're here. Here's the great part of today's subject. But after that, there's an A.D. that comes after the B.C. But after Christ in your own personal life, your own personal A.D., but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Why has God regenerated you? Because you were a cut above the rest? No, you were living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. God came and saved you from death and trespasses and in sins by virtue of his kindness. God acted in kindness to you. What's the word that we so often emphasize here that's not in this passage, but it is in a passage a few verses down, grace, unmerited favor. We are saved by grace. We were delivered in mercy. We've been given things that we don't deserve. We were not given the things that we do deserve. We're saved by grace through the mercy of Christ. Though we were all of these terrible things, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And when we say appeared here, we don't mean appeared as in it looked to be something, but appeared as in materialized. And that so often is the sense of the word appear as you read it in the KJV. It's not appear as in look, but it's appear as in appears before you. It materializes before you when he wrote, Paul to abstain from all appearance of evil, he didn't mean don't do things if they look sinful. Appearance there means like when something materializes before you. Anytime sin develops before you, when it appears before you, you go the other way. You flee from it. Dictionaries are helpful things. The appearance of the kindness and love of our Savior towards man. God's grace has brought salvation. 
But after that, after these terrible things, now let me tell you, this has reference to the personal, individual, vital phase of your salvation. You see, salvation is divided into phases, biblically. Where do you get that from? Well, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30 is a great example of it. You have God foreknowing and predestinating you, God justifying you, God calling you, and God glorifying you. There was a time in your life when you were justified, but you were not yet called. Because Jesus saved you on the cross, but he had not yet quickened you through the Holy Spirit. There was a time before he came into the world to die on the cross when some of his people were foreknown and predestinated, but they were not yet called, justified, and none of us are yet glorified. You see, salvation occurs in phases. You've got the covenant phase before the world began. You've got the legal phase upon the cross of Calvary when Jesus took our sin upon himself and he paid for it. He was the sin offering for it and he gave us his righteousness. You've got the vital phase of salvation distinct to every one of us when Jesus comes into our dead hearts and gives us life. And when we say vital in the sense of life-giving, and it is personal. This is the part of salvation that is distinct to each individual sinner. You see, when God chose his people before the world began, that happened at the same time. When? Before the world began. When Jesus made the atonement, that happened once for all of his people. When did that happen? For all of his people? Upon the cross. That means Hewlin and I, though he is in his young 80s, and I'm not quite out of my 30s, latching hold of that. I looked it up this week. I got about 200 more days in my 30s. That's a lot of decades in between us. But we were both justified by the blood of Christ at that instant when Jesus gave himself for us on the cross. But every single one of us in this room have a different time in our own lives, a different time in human history when God personally, individually, and vitally saved us. Amen. That time when you were born of the Spirit. When Jesus came to you personally. When the Spirit of His Son was sent into your heart crying, Abba, Father. Some of you it may have happened when you were little babies. Like John the Baptist who leapt for joy in his mother's womb. Some of you may have been like Saul of Tarsus. Growing great in power of this world. Living in cruelty and foolishness before God changed him on the road to Damascus. And then there are some that we read about in scripture such as the dying thief. Who lived a life of folly and sin. Who one moment on the cross mocked the Lord Jesus. And yet in another instant, as he hung crucified by Christ, began to call upon him and praise him and defend him. What happened to that dying thief? The grace of God that brought salvation hath appeared to him. The dying thief rejoiced to see the fountain in his day, as the hymn says. You've got a baby, a middle-aged man in all of his power. Perhaps even a young man, Saul of Tarsus, and you've got a man being executed. What is that telling us? That God will draw every one of his unto him, and it happens at different times in our lives. It doesn't always happen at the same time. It always happens the same way, God, but it doesn't always happen at the same time. We all have a different story. Remember that this is not only about God saving a people, but it's about God saving a people of individuals. It's about God saving you. And it's about God saving me. But after that, but after that period of sin in my life, this personal, vital, individual phase of salvation, as we approach this passage, we ask the question, what changed us from all of that? From deception and serving lust and malice and envy and hate, what saved us? What delivered us? What changed us? Read what it wasn't, not by works of righteousness which we have done, 
When a person first begins to feel the sting of sin, he suddenly flees to Mount Sinai. We have a hymn in our hymnal about that hell sovereign love that first began the scheme to rescue fallen man. That hymn talks about how the writer ran to Sinai, but he found no, he found no rest there. And then suddenly... He sees the gospel and he sees Christ and he sees how there is a hiding place there and there is rest there. We'll use that in a moment to sing together as our closing hymn. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. Ephesians 2, 9, not of works lest any man should boast. 2 Timothy 1, 9, his own purpose and grace has saved us which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But this is not according to our works. As Romans 11 says, works and grace are mutually exclusive so that if it be of one, it cannot include the other. Either works or grace. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Elder Joe Holder pointed out years ago that in the new birth, something is added and something is taken away. You have scriptures, Hebrews 8, for instance, 2 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 2 or 3, talks about that God has written his laws upon our hearts, the fleshy tables of our hearts. Something is added. Something is also taken away. Romans 2 describes it as a circumcision, much like the circumcision of the Old Testament, but completely different in other ways. Something is taken away, the filth of the flesh, but it is done upon the heart. It is done by the Spirit and not according to the letter of the law. It's something that God does Himself. And when we say heart, we have reference to the seat of human emotion, the core of your emotional and spiritual being. In regeneration, something is given, something is taken away. Regeneration is the new birth, quickening, translation, being born again, and it is an instant it is an instantaneous thing in which we are made new creatures or new creations in Christ Jesus, which tells us that the same power of God that created the universe at the beginning of time has given you spiritual life. You are a new creature. This is why it's something that is completely out of our power and control to do. Can you create a universe by springing it into existence? Well, I've said a lot of words in my life. I've never created anything with my words, except maybe trouble. New creatures in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation, created, as Ephesians 2.10 says, unto good works. The new birth happens, and then new wor or good works are enabled. We are regenerated, new creations. The washing of regeneration. There is a cleansing at the new birth. The Spirit of God now lives within us. God's laws have been written on our hearts. And so as Romans 7 says, whereas before we only knew it was wrong through the Ten Commandments telling us not to do it, now we know things are wrong because we have this soft-hearted conscience that hurts when we violate the law of God. And so when you're harsh, when you lie, when you steal, immediately or at some point after, you come to regret that when you realize what you've done. And I'll tell you, the more mature you grow in the faith, the quicker that is. It can be instant. I shouldn't have done that. All of this is because the laws of God are now written upon your heart. The washing of regeneration. There's a cleaning that happens at the new birth. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost literally renew, again new. You've been renewed. This word means a renovation. In the Greek language, it means a change for the better. You ladies, I'm sure that a lot of you did some renovating over the past 12 months when we were all stuck in our houses with stimulus checks. You know, it's kind of an interesting thing. It was a government renovation program. You cram everybody in their home and you give them a stimulus check. So what do you think all the women do? Well, I get that and I'm kind of like, you know what? My Corvette would be a lot faster with the 383 stroker with heads and cam. 
And I think that's going to be awesome. I'm getting excited. What shop can I use? And the next thing we know, we've got tile in the bathroom and new flooring all through and a vanity and a sink. And I'm just like, well, one day, <laughs> maybe, maybe the next stimulus check. And it didn't happen with that one either. But anyway, um, third time's a charm, maybe. Renovation, positive change, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now listen to me very carefully. We talk about salvation in phases, and we talk about God the Father choosing and God the Son redeeming and God the Spirit regenerating, but I want you to understand through the authority of Scripture that every blessing that we have is given to us by virtue of what Christ did for us upon the cross. When the Father chose you, you were chosen in Him, in Christ, before the world began. You were redeemed by Him as He gave Himself on the cross. And as the Spirit quickens you, it is the what, is, what do we read? That Christ takes up residence in your heart. The Spirit of His Son is sent into your heart, crying, Abba, Father... Every spiritual blessing that we have, we have through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Somebody asked me years ago in debate, if what you say is true about God's sovereignty and salvation, then why did Jesus even have to die? Because we were sinners. That doesn't mean that Jesus' work was unnecessary. No, all of this is in Christ. We're the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church of Christ. I trust the people of Christ, the friend of Christ, shed on us through Jesus, who justified us by His grace, that we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now you might say justification happened upon the cross. Why then is it mentioned in connection with regeneration? Because justification is legal. The legal term to justify means to declare not guilty or to declare righteous. And we were justified, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, at the cross. Why then mention it in connection with the new birth? The effects of the cross, what Jesus died to give you, are given to you personally and individually at the new birth at least the earnest or the first fruits of it. There's coming a day, as we wait the adoption to it, the redemption of the body, when everything that Jesus died to give us on the cross will be given to us. And what a day that will be. If this is the earnest, if these are the first fruits, a small down payment of the enjoyment of what we have with Him in glory, praise God, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, deliver us from this place. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope, the expectation, the anticipation of eternal life. And I'll close today by asking, do you have this hope? Do you have this anticipation? If you do, then Scripture commands you to profess and confess Him before men, to take up your cross and to be baptized, and to join His church and follow Him as a disciple all the rest of your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, that when we were foolish, when we were disobedient, when we were deceived, when we were slaves of lust, when we lived in malice, when we were envious and hateful, that the kindness and grace and mercy of God our Savior through Christ has appeared to us, regenerating us, renewing us, washing us, cleansing us. Lord, we pray that we would walk in that washing. We pray that we would walk in that cleansing. But Lord, thank you so much that salvation is by grace because Lord, we understand through all those verses we read that there was absolutely nothing we could do to change our situation. But what we couldn't do, our Savior has done. We thank you for that. We pray, Father, that these words were instructive and meaningful and impactful. And we pray, Father, that we would glorify you on account of it. We pray in Jesus' name, and we say amen. Praise God from whom.